and access management and how these forces, cloud, mobile, and social, are affecting identity. Gartner has been tracking these and has, has made these themes, research themes, for the last year or so, uh, and in addition to information or big data. But it is these three, cloud, mobile, and social, that are affecting identity and access management the most. I like to reminisce a little bit, thinking about the good old days, all of three years ago, where the things that clients were calling us about had to do with these two major use cases. Uh, and they were about Windows, desktops, and laptops, accessing legacy systems from an employee perspective, or, or consumers and partners coming in to an enterprise's external facing web applications. And the identity and access management market offered solutions that were increasingly mature, relatively tried and true. But as you all are well aware, things have changed quite a bit. So the, the biggest changes have to do with um, those two endpoints. Uh, bring your own device policies are causing major changes and some, some heartache when it comes to trying to leverage existing tools in the IAM space. Also, the adoption of cloud SaaS applications in particular has been driving quite a bit of interest from Gardner clients. And there is some interest in allowing the use of social identities and other third-party identities for accessing enterprise systems. And that's all well and good. Identity and access management functions and other security functions still have to be handled. And when you think about IAM technologies, which are really brokering functions, they exist because these functions have been uh, handled disparately by a variety of disparate systems. And cloud, particularly SaaS applications, are the new silos. Uh, with the default practice of having these identity and access management functions being handled one-off by each SaaS provider. So we'll talk about each of these and uh, how the world is dealing with these today in the world of evolving standards and what you can do to cope. So um, we can't forget that any time we talk about managing identity, we're talking about the core administration functions, so managing I uh, identities, the, the digital data about ourselves and our partners and constituents, um, also the entitlements that have to be managed, who has access to what. The access functions of authentication and authorization, the real-time verification of identity, and then managing uh, who has access to what in real time. And then uh, we use this fancy word intelligence to describe um, several functions, but the most common and the most well-worn are monitoring and reporting functions. All still needed, whether applications are on-premises or in the cloud, and whether you're accessing them from traditional desktops and laptops or mobile devices. So I want to spend a little bit of time on cloud and talk about our friends now, administration access intelligence. In, in the world of SaaS, uh, those organizations who have developed SaaS applications are first and foremost focused on delivering enterprise business functionality. And users in your organizations are often pulling out their credit cards and buying into this new evolutionary and sometimes revolutionary way of delivering business functionality, often without regard to security functions, uh, including identity and access management. So when, when these SaaS providers don't provide programmatic interfaces uh, or ways to leverage uh, an existing infrastructure that you may have deployed, then the unfortunate a uh, uh, result of that is one-off identity administration, where you have to manually administer identity on the SaaS app. There's a, yet another password uh, for your users to contend with. And event data, log data, is all bottled up inside the application. And you have to have some way to get at that and bring it down and perhaps uh, incorporate it into something like a, a security event information management tool. Now, the, the world is changing. The more SaaS that is out there, the more enterprises push SaaS vendors to um, be able to leverage uh, what's already been done in the enterprise. Things are starting to change, and there are some standards that are coming to bear to help that. But today, in the majority, we're still doing quite a bit of coping, such that for administration, 
there's manual, there's some export and import uh, operations that are quasi-manual. Uh, directory sync is, is pretty common for getting uh, for the CRUD operations, create, read, update, and delete uh, up to the cloud. And uh, occasionally, uh, SaaS vendors open up an API that can be used for programmatic provisioning. On the access side, we, we talked about the one-off techniques. In the early days of SaaS vendors being pressured by enterprises to open up APIs or provide a provisioning capability, um, I'm sorry, on, on the access side, the, the, the method was to give enterprises a proprietary shim that they could uh, integrate with a directory, for example. And, um, and that was fine for one SaaS app, but as the SaaS apps were built up and more were used by enterprises, then enterprises found themselves managing many proprietary access shims. Federated access uh, using standards, particularly SAML, um, has become the most common and most mature um, standard-based method for providing single sign-on and authentication, leveraging an enterprise's uh, directories and access management infrastructure, and we'll talk more about that. We're also going to spend a little bit of time talking about identity and access management as a service, which can broker um, several IAM functions to the cloud uh, on your behalf. In terms of uh, intelligence function, today um, export of uh, log data and event data that's been held by the SaaS vendor is, is the unfortunate the fault and also what is happening most prevalently. We are not yet at the point where there's a standard for moving that data back and forth other than standards for formatting that data. So of all, of all the areas where there are standards, um, access is the, is the most mature, uh, administration will be next, and uh, intelligence will lag in that area. So a little bit about the standards. You know, standards are that, are that glue, that thing that help us interoperate uh, in this hybrid environment that we have. So on the, on the access side, the, uh, the most tried and true standard is the Security Assertion Markup Language 2.0. It is the result of some converged standards, and this happened in 2005. It is, it is mature when a, when a SaaS vendor supports federated authentication uh, to its services. 19 times out of 20, this is the standard they're going to support. It's been around for a while. It's embedded in products. Um, it is well known uh, by vendors, at both SaaS and identity and access management spaces. And because it's mature, uh, it will stick around for a while. Uh, what I mean by this graphic here is that it, uh, it keeps on trucking. And I'm showing my age a little bit. So um, clients often ask, well, what about these newer standards, these new REST-based standards, OpenID and OAuth? And um, I tell them that those are, those are coming along. They're maturing. Uh, they show a lot of promise. Um, but they're, not, they, they're nowhere near the state of maturity that SAML is. OpenID has evolved in the predominantly the social net space. These are REST-based standards. And uh, developers today are preferring uh, development using REST-based standards because they're less verbose than um, XML standards, that, of which SAML is. Um, it is becoming the new language of the web, and uh, it leverages a bunch of established underlying standards. So OpenID does the basic redirect sort of dance that we've seen with SAML Federation, where a user uh, comes to a site they wish to visit and, um, and is allowed to authenticate uh, based on an identity they've provisioned elsewhere, say at uh, Google or Facebook or Yahoo something like that. And, and that is the redirection protocol that allows that. Now, OAuth has evolved out of the need to allow for one person or one service to enable sharing of resources with another uh, individual organization or service. The classical use case was an example was me sharing my pictures with another person without giving that person the password to my account. When you see a sign-on with your Facebook ID to, a, to a, um, a website, you're seeing some combination of OpenID and OAuth um, often coming together to make that happen. The, the newest standard is OpenID Connect. 
and it is intended to improve on an obsolete uh, earlier versions of OpenID and is a, is a nascent standard, but it looks very promising uh, for, for supporting a variety of use cases, uh, being REST-based and, uh, and also supporting mobile endpoints. And that represent, is represented by the young lady staring down the road wondering what her future will be. One more standard I want to mention is SCIM, the System for Cross-Domain Identity Management. This is um, a REST-based standard for, um, for CRUD operations for provisioning. And it is not a provisioning system. It is actually a language you know, API set for allowing one provisioning system to talk to another. So this standard will eventually play an important role in uh, provisioning identities that uh, you have already provisioned internally, but when you want to get them out to a uh, cloud or SaaS-based system. And it's really early days for this one as well. Just to give you a feel for that, if you're not familiar with Gartner hype cycles, uh, we have one for identity and access management. And uh, a hype cycle is designed to track the somewhat predictable path of, of technologies and standards over time to where they're introduced at the trigger point where they get hyped by the media and vendors often. We tend to find out that um, they are not cracked up uh, to be what uh, we originally thought they would be or, or how they were hyped, and they fall off into this trough of disillusionment. Sometimes standards or technologies will die on the vine. Uh, often they will emerge victorious, um, but uh, perhaps uh, not fulfilling the complete vision that, uh, that the creators had originally, but finding useful purpose. So as you move from left to right across this diagram, it implies uh, uh, more adoption and maturity in a particular uh, technology or standard. So my goal was not to go over each of these dots, but to highlight a few. And you'll notice that um, federated identity management off to the right, uh, and what we mean by that is really um, standards-based federated identity using SAML or using WS Federation, another uh, standard that we'll see often in uh, Microsoft-oriented implementations is quite mature. Um, again, it's embedded in quite a few products and uh, used in quite a few federations, and the majority of federations, uh, SAML is, that is. You'll see that OpenID, the earlier versions, are heading for obsolescence due to the emergence of OpenID Connect, but you can see where OpenID Connect, SCIM, and OAuth are. So really early days, lots of promise, but quite a bit of maturity that must, uh, must occur. One of the leading uh, client inquiries uh, to Gartner is on the topic of single sign-on. And uh, single sign-on does provide some benefits of user convenience. It provides uh, the ability to reduce authentication failure and password-related events uh, to the help desk, those kinds of calls. Um, it uh, sort of is a two-edged sword uh, for security. It can help and it can hinder. Uh, but it often leads, and you might wonder, wonder why, there are um, the need for SSO or the desire for SSO is really a, a symptom right, with a root cause of uh, these disparate identity islands, either internally or within the cloud or in the cloud. The, the reality is, is that those conditions exist for reasons. The, 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 uh, there are mergers and acquisitions, uh, vendor products come with identity and access management functions embedded and they're difficult to pull out and abstract. There are reorganizations, a variety of reasons. And, and the other projects that are designed to uh, better consolidate identity from multiple directories, um, from disparate databases, uh, and working on the business processes around provisioning, working around role lifecycle management, identity and access governance are, are desired, but they are often deemed too expensive, uh, time consuming and difficult, or they may be tackled at the same time. It's just not as quick a win as doing some kind of single sign-on initiative. So that's what's driving a lot of interest. Now when we think about uh, single sign-on tools, there are, um, there are quite a few. Uh, there are also um, a variety of permutations 
for handling specific problems with one or two systems. But what we found is that when clients call us, there are a few types of single sign-on tools that I'll mention briefly that tend to uh, be broad spectrum answers to the problem. And I tend to look at them in terms of whether the, in the user community, the using population, is an internal employee-oriented implementation, or if it's external facing, because it's a consumer environment. And then whether it's the applications or a common web architecture, which is increasingly the case as time goes by, or if the solution has to deal with legacy uh, heterogeneous architectures, such as thick client applications and the like. We know that there's plenty of, uh, of Active Directory out there. Um, it's an anchor uh, directory and an anchor authentication uh, uh, capability that's uh, enabled by so many organizations. And so um, it is a common part of a single sign-on strategy to leverage Active Directory and Kerberos that underlies it. Um, for at least part of an SSO strategy. In situations where there are legacy architected applications, and there are uh, such as the client applications, I even occasionally talk with clients who still have mainframe applications with uh, green screen kind of terminal emulators and web applications. And, and they want to solve SSO for that mix, and they want to solve it now. And that, that would generally indicate an enterprise single sign-on tool of the variety that uses an agent and pumps passwords into the user interfaces of applications. We're seeing less and less of a need uh, for that over time. Uh, web access management has been the, uh, the workhorse for internal and external facing web environments. Uh, these tools, they abstract uh, multiple methods of authentication um, and support uh, multiple heterogeneous web application server environments. They may also include federation capability, uh, standards-based federation capability, so you can have a common session environment for internal and uh, partner applications uh, that support a standard for federation. Um, federation can also be obtained through a variety of other means, through virtual directories, uh, through Microsoft's products, um, and through even through networking technology, um, and it can also be provided as part of an identity and access as a service solution. So let's talk a little bit um, about that IDES. There is a, a small uh, but growing market for identity and access management as a service. It has uh, come from a few different pedigrees, and it's delivered predominantly in two different flavors. One is uh, what I call legacy architected IDES. And what this is is a vendor who has taken a traditional identity and access management stack from the likes of, say, an Oracle, IBM, or CA, may have some proprietary technology added in, some open source technology added in, and they put it up in a dedicated hosted instance or in a multi-tenant SaaS environment and deliver it to you. And the legacy architected uh, IDAS, the stack is intended to support newer web applications but it can also do things like provision to your legacy applications that are that have databases and that clients and the like. And so these are these are being managed predominantly by vendors who have been and continue to be systems integrators and who have experience with the the uh, identity and access management stack vendors software. And these engagements to do that for you tend to look a lot like software plus SI kinds of engagements. The other major part of the market is what I call web architected um, IDAS. And this is a, a newer set of vendors that are not really focused on legacy applications. They have been predominantly focused on extending out the enterprise, the hybrid environment, but, but for web applications and SaaS. And they operate uh, by either providing you identity and access management functions in the cloud completely, uh, or more commonly, by joining up their cloud service uh, to your environment using an identity bridge. And this, uh, this will link directories uh, or access management systems to their service. And uh, the IDAS vendors will federate 
with a variety of SaaS vendors, an increasing bevy of them, so you don't have to. These vendors will uh, provision identities and deprovision identities to those SaaS vendors to the extent that those SaaS vendors have opened up synchronization or provisioning APIs to do so. And IDES vendors will also uh, deliver you reporting capability on the events that they can see. And that's an important distinction. They can only see what they provision to and provide access for. So this has been an area of increasing uh, interest for our clients. So where, where is this delivery of identity and access management functions going? You can sort of view this chart as a sort of set of predictions over time. Historically, clients who called us were interested in point solutions. They had X set of functionality. They needed to buy Y. And so we would have discussions about particular provisioning tools or access management tools. And that's still going to happen. But uh, over time, uh, identity and access management as a service uh, adoption will increase. It's under 10% today. Um, interest is increasing. And what we're saying here is when you wake up on New Year's Day uh, 2016 and you go out to buy some IAM functionality, we're saying there's a one in four chance that it's going to be delivered as a service over time. Um, Multi-function products will also see a rise. And by this, I mean uh, combinations of functionality that are provided under one SKU, one product where you're not buying a, a, a giant stack of software from one vendor that has loosely integrated components. Um, so the combination of WAM and Federation and ESSO that some vendors uh, provide are an example of a multifunction product. Open source will continue to hum along. Uh, there are some clients who are finding value in implementing open source. There is some maturity in web access federation and directories in that area, not so much in identity and access governance or provisioning. And that will still continue to occupy a portion of, of what is bought. Um, suites will probably be, but the legacy style suites will probably suffer the most uh, in years out. We want to let people log into our site with their Facebook IDs, says the client. And I say, well, that's great. And uh, this, this tends to happen um, quite a bit in uh, retail and uh, media uh, and in uh, gaming kinds of situations. And governments are interested in, in doing this as well and some other industries. When we have this discussion with clients, we, we often talk about the technology that's needed to enable that. And then we also tend to talk about identity insurance. Uh, the, the, uh, the information that's held about us and, uh, on Facebook and other social nets uh, obviously is becoming um, increasingly prevalent. It's uh, becoming increasingly voluminous. Um, and it's becoming intertwined. And where one could argue that uh, there's quite a bit known about us that could support identity proofing and identity verification uh, authentication functions. Uh, in, in this environment. And uh, while that is true, um, you still can be that dog on the internet. And I know because my dog is on Facebook and she has friends. But the key point I want to make is that um, while it's, it's great to accept uh, these kinds of identities for, for access to your systems, there's still some, some caution advised and that um, they are appropriate for certain kinds of interaction generally in the medium to low assurance level. Um, but if you want to use them and you're going to deliver uh, both uh, low risk content and interactions and then also sensitive content and transactions, then um, a strategy is needed to be able to handle that breadth of need. So for, for access, uh, we're starting to see this kind of setup. And we think that we'll increasingly see that. And that as an enterprise, You'll need a capability, uh, traditional access management and federation. Federation being able to, to speak the new specifications that we talked about earlier, OpenID Connect and OAuth in addition to the traditional ones. You'll, you'll need to be able to support mobile devices, um, not just web applications or web browsers running on those mobile devices, but also native mobile resident applications. And to be sure that people are who they say they are for particular transactions, then you'll need um, in access management the ability to step up authentication and fraud prevention uh, for, for those kinds of interactions. 
You'll need to leverage on-hand information that you have. Um, you'll also need to um, leverage what's available uh, through these new mobile devices. It's not all problems for adding mobile devices. There are new opportunities there with uh, geolocation, IP address, the ability to run authentication um, software, use out-of-band authentication, the ability to store um, certificates on these endpoints, um, and biometric capabilities that are uh, becoming more prevalent on devices, uh, keyboard dynamics, uh, voice interface, and cameras that are coming on more and more devices. So we think this combination of things will increasingly play a role in providing access assurance in the future. But to dwell a little bit more on, on mobile, um, the mobile web applications generally have a good story when it comes to uh, accessing an, an enterprise's web applications. Uh, mobile browsers with cookies turned on uh, can generally be supported with today's access management solutions. Uh, also, uh, in an environment where an enterprise may wish for a mobile user who's outside of the logical enterprise perimeter to authenticate back home uh, when that user um, accesses a SaaS application first, um, the, the protocols uh, are in place to deal with that today. The SaaS vendor has to support um, redirection from its service back into the enterprise access management system. And uh, you know that's fairly nascent, but it is possible uh, and will probably grow in prevalence as we move forward. The, uh, the problematic um, use case is one where uh, mobile resident apps, native apps, are being run on tablets and uh, various mobile devices. And uh, what, it, what is really needed there is a standards layer um, and also um, the ability to support not only an enterprise's set of applications, but also um, apps that may be downloaded um, from the SaaS vendors. So these, these apps are not under the direct development control of the enterprise. And there are a variety of ways for dealing with this today, and none of them are perfect, um, and it's an area that we'll continue to watch. Um, mobile device management plays a part of a role uh, in this. Um, also, um, the way access management vendors are dealing with this, we're starting to see the introduction of SDKs that uh, would fill in this abstraction layer to the lower left on the mobile device. And if you develop your apps to that SDK, then the, uh, the abstraction layer there will work just fine with your, um, the access management solution provided by that vendor. So there, there are elements of if you want the functionality, there may be some lock in there at least for now, until we can get some kind of standard layer out there on the endpoint. So uh, where, where have we come from, and what's life going to be like? Uh, the bottom line is, unless you're a greenfield uh, environment and uh, are all, have all SaaS apps and have uh, a homogeneous uh, end, endpoint computing environment, the hybrid cloud um, and enterprise models are the new norm. Also, uh, mobile endpoints, uh, it's trite but true, are becoming the norm as well. And they have to be considered up front when, uh, when thinking about access management solutions and administration solutions as well. Standards are great, and we have a lot of them. Uh, some of them are more mature than others. And uh, there are ones that are promising, but you should probably plan for these uh, new REST-based protocols to be more prevalent in the two to three year or greater horizon. And I'm particularly referring to OpenID Connect and OAuth. Um, identity and access management as a service uh, isn't, isn't for everyone today. Um, however, it is gaining interest, and it is maturing, and is delivering uh, good value. One thing I would leave you with is that um, SaaS is being um, obtained by lines of business, and IT isn't always involved. And anything you can do, if that's the situation in your organization, to get involved with the line of business and the procurement folks and make sure that security, uh, identity, and access management functions are included uh, when, in the functional requirements when you go out for procurement. In terms of, of buying into IDAS, 
Um, certainly, uh, from a TCO standpoint, uh, it's not clear that there'll be uh, money to be saved, but uh, organizations who are buying into IDAS are interested in removing a problem, uh, making it easier for themselves, um, also dealing with resources that may be lacking and will continue to lack in terms of being able to bring on people that can support an identity and access management function. So it's, a, it's viewed as um, mobile use cases uh, clearly on the rise. Um, the adoption of bring your own device policies also rise. So SaaS um, applications, uh, mobile resident apps, increasingly an issue that have to be dealt with. And lastly, um, I'll just reiterate that uh, social identities and the use of those, um, the interest in that is on the rise. Uh, just do so in a way that takes into account uh, different risk assurance profiles for your data and application. And think about an access management infrastructure that can leverage those things. So thank you very much for your time. And now I'll hand it over to Justin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let's just get this screen shared. Um, show my screen. All right, everybody see my screen? Great. All right, thanks so much, Greg. And thank you all for listening in this morning. We've got a great attendance today that we're very happy about. Uh, today, I'll spend the next few minutes talking about Radiant Logic's approach to federated identity. Uh, in this session, I'll run through the conceptual framework behind federated identity, uh, where it fits in the IAM stack, and talk about how it works at a technical level. Now, as we all know, the past few years have seen a proliferation of new technologies, uh, both in the access devices, uh, like mobile devices, and also in the sorts of applications that enterprises are using. And this has changed the landscape of identity and access management uh, in very substantial ways. Now, in what Greg called the good old days of a few years ago, different user populations tended to reside in distinct data sources and access different applications. Many enterprises made serious investments in a world that looks like this. Uh, they have their applications, each of which has served uh, a certain user population with certain requirements. Uh, maybe employees were in an active directory forest while customers run an LDAP. Uh, those populations were very distinct and worked with separate applications. Now, maybe there's overlap in the identity repositories uh, with employees in all of them, but they're stored in a distinct schema and format to match the requirements of a particular application. Uh, the numbers here are all small, uh, and all of the action is taking place within the firewall. Now, because of that, the applications and the data stores could often be tailored to meet one another's constraints. Uh, but over, over time, we've clearly seen the proliferation of new technologies destabilize that equilibrium. To meet the rise of off-premises applications, whether SaaS or Federation, and new access devices that frequently cross the firewall, organizations organically tried to keep up by building custom connectors to allow various user populations to access new applications. That's where the proprietary shims that Greg was referencing earlier fit in. Now, as those connectors proliferated, enterprises often found themselves with infrastructures that look something like this. Each individual step may have made sense, but the result is a, a tangled mess of connectors between applications and data sources trying to allow everyone to access everything we want them to access. It creates a system that I like to call a system of interlocking dependency. Now, in this kind of world, you can't remove a component without worrying that the whole house of cards will come down and adding a new one gets ever more difficult as the n squared problem kicks in, right? As each connector necessitates even more uh, other connectors and constraints. Each piece becomes more expensive to deploy and maintain. Now, a system like this clearly doesn't scale well. You're beholden to the slowest piece in your infrastructure, unable to replace it or cut it out of the loop. Uh, moreover, user profiles are hard to build because data about users is probably scattered across multiple data sources. And that means that providing a single sign-on experience to your applications can be all but impossible. And delivering rich enough data about your users to allow for strong authorization routines it can just be a fantasy. If you can't build a coherent picture of your users and pass it efficiently to your applications, your IAM system is at a serious disadvantage. Now, 
to overcome these challenges, we've seen the rise of federated systems. Now, in these approaches, like units delegate some of their authority to a central hub, and then those hubs interact. Uh, this approach has led to a system with two layers in IAM, a security layer on top, which is where app federation is happening, and an identity layer beneath it, which harmonizes identity sources. The security layer takes responsibility for the authentication routines. And as we see here, it's an externally facing service, both on web standards to support federation. Now, the internally facing identity layer pulls together identity information that we need to authenticate and authorize users. And it uses an LDAP structure to aggregate and correlate that data into a coherent view that can then be leveraged by the security and protocols layer. Now, these two components have often been seen as separate in the marketplace as two distinct products. But at Radiant Logic, we see these two layers as converging into a single technology, which is what we call federated identity. And our Radiant One solution contains both components, a virtual directory in the identity layer and a new cloud federation service in the security layer. We believe such a federated identity service is the best solution uh, to many of the challenges facing enterprises in a hybrid world of on-premises and cloud applications. So let's take a moment to walk through some of those challenges now. In a cloud deployment, the role of an identity provider is to authenticate and authorize users of remote applications using the available identity data. And we see here sort of the flow through which that happens. When a user requests access, the request goes to the application. But that application then relies on an identity provider to grant authentic to authenticate users and provide the attributes needed for the application to do authorization. Now, the IDP authenticates the user against a, a broad mix of, authentic of authentication sources because data about users is so often scattered across lots of different sources. Now, that IDP creates a token and the form uh, that that application understands uh, and passes it back. Now, there are some real challenges facing IDPs in trying to do this job. Let's walk through some of those now. Uh, now a broad set of challenges arises when data is stored across a diverse set of identity sources. One of the biggest is that an identity provider needs to rationalize identity information and then authenticate users from a wide variety of sources. You have overlapping and conflicting profiles for the same user in different places. So the, fle the same flesh and blood person can have conflicting information in different repositories which may or may not share a username. At the same time, different human beings can have identical usernames in different places. So there are a lot of namespace challenges that arise. You've also got valuable information about roles or groups that can be scattered across those same data sources. Now, ADFS uh, can cover employees in AD forests, we see uh, in the lower left. Um, now, that means that your identity provider in the middle has to support federation protocols. Now, since there's no ADFS-like solution for your non-AD sources, your LDAPs, your databases, they need to come in through form-based authentication. So that may cover some subset of your customers that you control because you own the storage directly. But then there's this third piece we see on the right of Azure ACS and other outside identity providers you might use, like Google or Facebook. Uh, they, now, those are IDPs in and of themselves who can authenticate for you and provide you with some profile information about your users. Now, that means your IDP has to be able to form trust relationships between your IDP and others and connect those profiles to additional information about users that may be living in your own data repositories. Now, obviously, that sets a high bar for an IDP to reach in meeting all of these diverse authentication needs uh, that are very common for enterprises. And another challenge, while many organizations rely on Active Directory as the, the core repository for their employees, who are probably their core user group, AD can often get slammed when asked to support more than it was designed for, like gracefully handling non-Microsoft apps. This often leads to chasing users across forests and other data sources. So Microsoft developed a global catalog to, to create a global list of users and then forward requests to the home domain. But that whole process isn't always well supported by web apps. Usernames uh, are unique, but often aren't reconciled. So same flesh and blood person can live in multiple places across those Active Directories. Now, to allow all applications to work cleanly with Active Directory users, you need a more advanced IDP uh, than ADFS. Now finally, Applications can expect data about users in radically different formats, and most often with very different attributes 
uh, and different attribute naming conventions. So an identity provider needs to be able to have access to the broadest set of attributes possible about a user, and then be able to reconcile and remap those attributes to meet the expectations of your apps on the fly. Now, we're proud to say that our federated identity service, Radiant One, solves these problems. But how does it work creating such an all-encompassing IDP? I will walk through the process. So when you pull together these two layers that we discussed earlier, the security and the identity layer, into a federated identity service, you reach this model. Now with a federated identity hub and a secure token service at the middle of your network, you gain a whole lot of flexibility and scalability. Each application and data source is a spoke off of this common center. So taking on new initiatives that call for a new application is a simple integration just to your federation hub. Now, if you have a merger or acquisition, or you otherwise acquire a whole new population of users, then integrating that new group with your applications um, can now be quite literally a matter of minutes or hours, rather than the weeks or months it might take uh, otherwise, because all you need to do is connect it to that central identity layer. Now, you can see we're solving the too many links problem with one go-to source. So when we open this box up a little bit, this is the architecture that we see underneath. Identity sources of all variety can plug into the identity layer, while the applications and other trusted identity providers interface with the security layer. Those two layers, of course, are deeply intertwined, which is how all of your users with all of their information can access all of your applications. So when we look at that identity layer behind a federated identity service, here are some of the key properties that we need to bear in mind. First, it's remapping attributes through virtualization. By virtualizing data out of the underlying data sources, we gain a great deal of flexibility in how we manipulate and then serve it to applications. Now, we're also correlating uh, users across different data sources to build a single identity picture of all of our users and as a result of our entire identity universe. Uh, our, federated, our federated identity service is constantly synchronizing for up to the minute information. When a change happens in an underlying data source, which still maintains its autonomy, that change can be reflected in near real time in the federated directory that's serving your applications. We're also able to store this uh, federated directory that we're building with advanced caching so that it's persistent and available even if an underlying source goes offline. And finally, we're transforming uh, protocols of requests so that local uh, credentials meet the requirements of our applications through a secure token service. So let's walk through the process by which that happens at a slightly more technical level. So first, it's essential to understand that a federated identity layer is built on virtualization. We're creating a level of abstraction that sits above the identity sources themselves, which means your underlying infrastructure can go unchanged. But with our sophisticated virtualization, we're constantly listening those underlying data sources, so you never have to worry about thinking them. When changes occur, like I said, they're reflected in near real time. And now finally, the federated directory, though it's based on virtualization, can be written out and stored. So that means that all of the computational work that goes into building uh, this federated directory doesn't need to be repeated for each query. This persistent caching keeps your data accessible, even if an underlying data source goes offline. And it allows you to access the information stored in your slowest components, your slowest database, at the speed of an LDAP query. Finally, it obviously strengthens our scalability. It's easy to duplicate this directory and run it in parallel, making the sky the limit in terms of scalability. Now, Radiant One allows all of your sources to talk to all of your applications by leveraging that virtualization to dynamically remap object classes and repackage attributes to meet the demands of the consuming application. The virtual uh, directory uh, becomes your one point of access for all applications. That means it automatically remaps, transforms, so that virtualization essentially allows everything to talk to everything in its native language. Now, the second step is to perform a union of your users. This means pulling the, the user lists from each of your data sources and reconciling in the, them into one authoritative global list of users. This global list forms the backbone of this new federated directory that we're building in the identity layer. Now, in all likelihood, 
you'll have instances where the same flesh and blood person shows up in multiple data sources with different usernames. Our federated identity service links those identities across silos to a common, unique identifier. That way, as a user moves across applications, their identity will follow them, enabling a single sign-on that can otherwise be so elusive when users, when users' names can't follow them. Now, at the same time, you may have Joe Smith, the janitor, and Jane Smith, the CEO, um, but in separate silos, they're both Jay Smith. So that's obviously a problem. Uh, you don't want to have your janitor authenticate in one place and find he has access permission to the CEO and others. These users have to be disambiguated and separated. So we use the cascading logic to resolve these ambiguities, linking users that are the, or linking accounts that tie to the same flesh and blood person and separating those that don't. Now, the next step is to perform a join, where we pull together attributes for all of our users from across all of these data sources to build a complete picture of everything we know about a user. And with that complete profile, we can feed applications the attributes that they expect. Now, with your user's global profile, with your user's global profile built, it's easy to authenticate. Even if you're mobile, you can come in on a device and access the identity provider and log in with your AD credentials. Um, even if you're not using a browser proper, phone applications can wrap the authentication request and just on HTTP make this request and then still use uh, standards like SAML to authenticate and access uh, your applications through the federated identity layer. So uh, how do we host this federated identity system? Well, having so much identity information hosted in the cloud while you're still supporting legacy on-premise applications, we feel is risky. That's a lot to expose to the wilds of the internet. So what we tend to recommend for storing, sorry, for hosting such a federated identity service is to reconcile and rationalize all of your identities at home within your firewall, allowing you to pass only secure tokens built by your identity provider uh, from the on-premise space to your cloud applications on the internet. Uh, and of course, to your on-premises applications at home. So, in winding down, uh, let's review the benefits of a federated identity service based on virtualization. First, it's great for a stronger authentication by creating one secure access point for all of your cloud and other external applications where all of your users can come in and be authenticated. Uh, second, it strengthens your authorization by delivering a valid, complete, and attribute-enriched picture of all of your users to each of those consuming applications. And for deployment, we can manage all of our interactions with identity in one space, make it much easier to audit, to gain that intelligence that Greg was talking about earlier. Um, we, can improve our, we can improve our user experience because with all of our users sharing a common main space and authenticating through one point, we can deliver SSL across local, cloud and federated applications, and it allows us to much more easily add and remove uh, applications and data sources as new initiatives and new opportunities arise. So finally, uh, the last advantage to really touch on is that hiding the complexity of your infrastructure from your applications allows the need to each get a clean image of your identity backend, uh, which is great for your reliability. Your applications, your applications just see the IDP which, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead a little there. Your applications just see the IDP, which in this case is our Cloud Federated, our Cloud Federation service, CFS. That identity provider, in turn, just sees the virtual directory service, which is feeding it a custom view that matches whatever attributes the app needs in their preferred schema, protocol, and format. And the result is that each application sees just what it needs, regardless of your underlying repositories. This creates flexibility for you and your underlying infrastructure, as you can separate your apps and your user experience from dependence on your underlying and perhaps aging infrastructure. And with that, we'll close here and we'll take some questions. Thanks so much for your uh, time and attention. If you'd like to learn more or to review the stack, I'll be uploading it shortly after this presentation to this short link here. Um, and of course, we have a, a wide variety of resources on our website that address a lot of specific use cases uh, and specific implementations that you may wonder about if you're considering a federated identity service. Uh, lastly, I always encourage uh, you to follow us on Twitter uh, because it's a great way to keep up to date with our upcoming events like future webinars 
uh, and other information about what's going on at Radian Logic. Uh, and finally, if you have any specific questions you'd like to ask, I'm Jordan Phillips. Uh, there's my email address. I encourage you to uh, uh, reach out and contact me with any follow-up you may have. All right, thanks again for your time, and I'll hand it back to Alice, our moderator. Great. Thank you, Greg and Jordan. I'm just going to throw out a few of the questions we've received, and you can decide who answers them. So the first one is, there was a lot of talk this last summer about the death of SAML. What is your take on that? I guess I'll, this is Greg, I guess I'll go ahead and take that. Great. Nice to start. So, uh, yeah, I've heard, I've heard uh, that talk. It's kind of loose talk. Um, I think uh, f for that to happen, it's going to be a long time down the road. And when, when, uh, when clients ask me about that, um, they said, what should I use today? And I say, today, if you can get it, and by that I mean if your, your provider, your partner supports it, use SAML 2.0. What about next year? SAML 2.0. The year after that, you'll still have SAML around. The, the, the newer specifications um, are going to need to be supported, and you will see them become embedded in products that you use and that you'll rely on over time, over the next one to two years. And mostly, you'll need to support them um, when you require the social net kind of use cases that we described uh, earlier going to be this cloud-to-cloud -cloud and uh, SaaS-to-SaaS -SaaS kind of application that we use the newer protocols, and also when you need to accept inbound IDs where the identity provider only supports that, that set of specifications. Okay, excellent. Uh, the second question we have, can you discuss the current problems of using Linux free IPA uh, to integrate it with to integrate with Microsoft Windows authentication using Kerberos. Greg, would you be able to take that one? Um, not me. Jordan, did you have something? Uh, not on that one. I'll leave that to you. Okay. You can always so, circle back to that one if you like. We've yeah. got quite a list of questions to go through. So um, let's I'll, go ahead and skip through. Oh, I'm sorry. You have... we'll, we'll give that go one ahead, a shot. Jim. So, so um, with, with Unix and Linux implementations, um, there are generally a couple of options, um, maybe three, maybe four, for integrating with Active Directory. Um, one, there may be um, native uh, LDAP support in, uh, in the particular um, Unix implementations that you're talking about. Um, but that, just, that gets you basic LDAP authentication to Active Directory and um, the ability to pull attributes usually, um, not Kerberos-based single sign-on. Um, you may um, have a Kerberos library um, from, from that same uh, open source implementation that can be brought to bear. Uh, in situations where you have um, a, a Linux implementation that doesn't have uh, support for either of those, um, or uh, where you have multiple Unix and Linux uh, implementations with different uh, release levels and so forth, and many, many systems. And that's often where we'll see uh, what we've called an Active Directory bridge being used. And um, these tools, um, re are, they replace the, the PAM architecture, uh, uh, or the, they use the PAM architecture, rather, to uh, to enable Kerberos um, authentication via an Active Directory uh, domain controllers. And they also allow for the administration of identity uh, for Unix systems within Active Directory and also um, can provide some uh, management of Unix um, access rights through group policy. OK, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, let's see, next question. Can the Radiant One VDS work only with your CFS identity provider, or are there other options? Yeah, great question. Uh, so as I said earlier, we see these sort of two technologies converging into a, a single uh, sort of product going forward. But absolutely, CFS is just one example of a federated identity uh, provider that you can use. Uh, any identity provider that can access an LDAP uh, will be able to work just fine with our, with our VDS. Um, if you already have a federated architecture and you've deployed a federation component, you could use that IDP. Um, and by the end of the year, actually, you'll hear an announcement uh, from another large vendor about using our VDS together with their federation component uh, to offer another identity bridge solution. And I should also note, I think I saw another question, uh, that CFS can certainly trust other IDPs uh, and can work as a service provider 
with uh, uh, Azure, with Azure, with uh, ADFS, uh, with other existing federation uh, providers as well. Okay, fantastic. Uh, what is your view on SPML slash ZACML going forward? And that's for Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so um, SPML um, had some success in user provisioning implementations, uh, and certainly in uh, for legacy targeted systems. We often see it being used um, between um, components in an IAM stack, um, such as you know provisioning into a, a directory or to a uh, or to another to an access management component. Um, it has been um, almost 100% absent from the cloud, and so and uh, that is the reason for uh, development of SCIM, something that is more lightweight and REST-based. Um, it was general SPML was generally uh, viewed as uh, too heavy duty, uh, too much, and too hard to implement um, for for cloud implementations. Um, Exactmul um, is is. Um, still um, a workhorse uh, specification for um, access management solutions, particularly what we've called um, externalized um, authorization management solution. It is the spec that is um, used uh, certainly for the policy language and also for um, communication among various components in, a, in an access management infrastructure, the, the policy enforcement and policy decision and information points. And so um, you see that standard in varying degrees implemented in externalized authorization management products. It's uh, it it uh, it's going to live on. Um, I, I think what will will become important as as we move forward and, and taking into account uh, REST based standards like you know, OAuth for authorization is that you know similar to what you heard uh, from from Jordan about the need for secure token services and the ability to flip tokens say from Kerberos to, to SAML, I think you're going to need um, uh, vendors to provide uh, gateway kinds of operations that will that will kind of speak uh, between OAuth, translate between OAuth and, and Exacomal to deal with the, the cloud use cases. Great. And I would just uh, uh, add a short addendum there that from our perspective, we're very excited about the rise of externalized authorization and through Zacmal as well. And, uh, one of the, in order to make those systems work, it's very important to have uh, an authoritative attribute server, something that can act as your, your information point for all of those uh, access policies that you're developing. And that means having access to as many attributes as possible from your users to the richest profile you can in order to do secure externalized authorization. And so we're actually very excited about using our virtual directory, our federated entity service, to feed attributes to an externalized uh, authorization policy engine, um, whether it's using DACMO or anything else, to do uh, secure authorizations that way. Okay. Unfortunately, that is all the time. That is all we have time for today. We have many other questions that we unfortunately did not get to on this webinar, but we will be following up with you individually to answer all of your questions. So thank you for sending all of those in. Um, we will be sending out a link to the slides and recording from today's sessions. And uh, once again, you will all be answered directly via email for your questions. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much to Greg and to Jordan. Uh, have a wonderful day.